starting in verse 4 and going down to verse 9. And uh, what I'd like to do is just begin with reading this whole section again, just so it's uh, fresh on our hearts and our minds. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, Philippians chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 4. Uh, this is what Paul says. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, oh, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever, whatever is of good repute, if there is anything excellent and if anything worthy of praise, think on these things. And the things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. What an incredible passage. Uh, yesterday we were looking at the uh, first aspect of this, this whole idea of rejoicing always. And again, what we were talking about is it's not based on circumstance, it's not based on situation. The whole reality of the thanksgiving and the rejoicing is all based on the fact that God is a God of joy. And that He is rejoicing. And as such, because he now fills your life as a believer, that should be bubbling forth out of you, and therefore you should be joyful, full of joy. And what would that look like in your life? Could you imagine facing every Monday morning with joy? <laughs> and, I, and I know biblically it's the day of no blessing, because if you look at the creation account, you know, there's a blessing for Sunday, there's a blessing for Tuesday, in fact, there's two for Tuesday, one for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but there are, is no blessing in the creation account for Monday. God did not bless Mondays, which makes sense to me. But could you imagine waking up on a Monday morning and still having joy? So even though it is a day of no blessing, woo, you can still rejoice as you're heading into work or whatever it is that you do. Waking up in your retirement, oh, praise the Lord. Again, or whatever it is your life looks like. Uh, last night we were looking at this idea of gentleness and the fact that you are called to be gentle. And it's not gentleness in the sense of quietness or shyness. The idea of gentleness here that is to be known to everyone around you is this idea that, that you are more interested in the person than the offenses they may cause you. That you're actually willing to overlook the offense that someone causes to showcase love and mercy and kindness. In other words, you are being Jesus to the people around you. So just as you have received the gentleness and the mercy and the kindness of God in your life via the cross of Christ, is it possible for him to take that gentleness that he has demonstrated in your life and now pour that upon the people around you? And you are called to be gentle. Now, <clears throat> what I'd like to do this evening is start to look at verse 6. And I'd like to spend tonight and tomorrow night looking at verse 6. There's so much in this passage. In fact, we could probably spend the entire time together looking at just verse 6. Uh, but I didn't want to bog you down. But I just want to ponder this idea. Look at verse 6 again with me. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. Are you kidding me? <laughs> do you hear what Paul's saying? He says, do not be anxious about anything. Now, I have a long list of things I could be anxious about. And I'm sure you have one too. In fact, if we compared our list, my guess is they'd be probably similar. For example, the country. The political system. The voting system. I'm not trying to make political statements, I'm just making statements. The economy, the supply chains, the wars and the rumors of war. I mean, we could just start going down the list, let alone family stuff, finance stuff. I mean, there, there's so much in our world today to giving anxiety and fretting and foreboding and, and worry. And, and again, as I mentioned yesterday morning, if you look at our culture, even Christian culture, our whole culture is wrapped up in fear. And fear in our modern society is now deemed cool and hip. And whereas before it was actually a thing that we always wanted to avoid because we wanted to have that appearance of John Wayne, that fearlessness, you know, that brave-hearted kind of mentality. The reality is, is at this point in modern culture, it seems like if you are bold and you're strong, you're actually part of the problem. 
And if you're fearful and you're passive, that is now culturally norm. But yet scripture says, do not fear. That there should be nothing that you should be anxious about. It's interesting, that word anxious, when you actually get into the word, the word actually means to be cut up and divided into little pieces. And isn't that what fear does? Isn't that what anxiety does to us? That when you walk in anxiety and you walk in fear, it's, it's like you're, you're all piecemealed. You're, you're, you're all over the place. Emotionally, physically, spirit. I mean, you're, just, you're, you're wrestling and you're just in this turmoil. And Paul says that should not go on inside of you. That there should be nothing that causes anxiety. Could you imagine facing this world where nothing causes fear to rise up in your life? You would be crazy in, in, in terms of the culture. I mean, could you imagine not having a single thing that causes anxiety or trepidation? Uh, it was interesting during the middle of the COVID stuff. Uh, I, again, I, I don't know what was happening around here. It seems like Missouri was fairly normal. <laughs> Praise the Lord for Missouri. Colorado is not normal on so many levels. And uh, we, where I live, just happens to be the most conservative county in all of Colorado. But surrounding us are, is some of the most hyper-liberal, crazy counties in Colorado. In fact, there are things that the liberals will try out in Colorado to see if they work in the liberal parts, and then they'll start bringing them into places like California and New York. I mean, it gets crazy. And so if you can imagine, in the middle of COVID, we had all this pressure and all this insanity and all this. And as a, as a little tiny church, we're just like, no, we're not buying it. We, we will not fear. And do you know how hard it is to say that when everyone else around you is screaming and crying and yelling? and That's not normal. Uh, Billy Graham, could you imagine this? Back in 1965 said this. <laughs> this just cracks me up. In 1965, Billy Graham said, historians will probably call our era, the 60s, the age of anxiety. Now, I did not grow up in the 60s. And if you did, my guess is you look back and like, that, that was not anxiety. I mean, I'm not Billy Graham, but I would probably say that historians are going to look back at the 2010s, 2020s of American history and say that was the age of fear. And yet do you realize that biblically there is no reason to walk in fear or anxiety or trepidation. There's no reason to forebode. There is no reason to shake in your boots. None. Uh, Proverbs 12, 25 says this, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Do you know what anxiety does? It weighs you down. It, it puts all this pressure and heaviness upon your soul. Do you know what the number one command in Scripture is? Do not fear. It is given more than any other command in Scripture. It's more than love your neighbor. It is more than you name the command. Do not fear is stated more often than any other command in Scripture. Isn't it interesting when, when Joshua was taking over the role of leadership of the Israelites, that God in Joshua chapter 1 comes to Joshua and says, Joshua, he says it multiple times, Joshua, be strong and have good courage. Meaning what? No fear. You're about to take over the leadership. You're about to take over this massive group. And what have they been doing for 40 years? Complaining <laughs> and dying off. And here you are, you're about to enter the promised land, and yes, there are giants, and yes, there are walled cities, and yes, there's all these things that could cause fear and foreboding, but Joshua, I am with you, so fear not. Be strong and of good courage. And did you know that that actually became the battle cry of the Israelites? That when you actually trace the battle cry of the Israelites all through their history, even to the present day, their battle cry in Hebrew is be strong and of good courage. That that is, that's their, that's their war cry. That as they head into battle, they're screaming forth, in, in Hebrew, be strong and of good courage. Why? Because the Lord is with us. Wouldn't it be neat if you took that on as your battle cry? That you would wake up every morning and say, you know what, the Lord is with me, so I can be strong and of good courage. Therefore, I can rejoice in this day. Today's a day of rejoicing. 
Why? Because I have the God of the universe on my side. What would I have to fear? Uh, Richard Wurmbrandt was a, a Romanian pastor uh, back in the World War II era. And uh, as World War II was kind of getting crazy and uh, the, the Soviets were taking over Romania and, and that kind of part of the world, uh, Richard Wurmbrandt was brought before the Communist Socialist Party and basically as a pastor was told, uh, you are either going to come in line with the party mandate or you will go to jail. And so here he is as a pastor saying, well, I, I'm, I, I can't just agree with that because they're going to tell me what to preach. And he says, I'm going to preach the word, even if that means prison. And he's sitting, he's sitting in the, in the, uh, the aisle and they says, is, was anybody like to come up and make a statement? And could you imagine, Richard Rembrandt's wife, Sabina, pokes him and says, why aren't you going up there and speaking? He's like, darling, if I go up there, I will go to jail. And here was her words. I love this. She goes, I would rather be married to a dead man than a coward. <laughs> Wives, you have influence. <laughs> and Richard Wormbrandt gets up and goes and just says, hey, this is wrong. And we as pastors need to proclaim the truth of God's word and not what is being toted to us. And so in Romania, he was prisoner number one. And he was sent to Rom uh, Romanian prison, was tortured for well over a decade. Crazy, crazy stuff. Richard Wurmbrandt, before he was arrested, said there were 366 distinct commands in Scripture of do not fear. One for every single day of the year, including leap year. And supposedly he had every single one of them memorized. And he said it was brilliant, later looking back on this whole thing. He said, the reason I find that so important is because, do you know what day he was arrested? It was February 29th, 19, whatever year it was. And as he was, had a hood thrown over his head, as he was thrown in the back of a car, and as he was being towed off to prison, where he was going to be severely, severely tortured, he was in the back of the van, he said, God, today there's no reason for me to fear because there's a promise and a command for this day for me not to fear. Could you imagine? This man was so bold. And if, if, you, if you've ever read his story, Tortured for Christ, you need to add that to your book list. It is so, so stirring. But he said as, as he was being tortured one day, he was brought before one of the high commanding officers and the officer was doing all these intimidation tactics and yelling in his face and just getting really intense. And, and Richard Wormbrandt just sat there and the man looking at Richard Wormbrand says, are you not afraid of me? And here was, here was Richard's response. Could you imagine, just imagine saying this. He goes, sir, I do not fear you. In fact, check my heartbeat. If it has gone up one single beat, the normal, there is no God in the universe. I mean, are you kidding me? If you came up and yelled at me, my heart rate would go up. And I'm not in prison, I'm not being tortured. I just don't like people yelling at me. Could you imagine living in such a way with a confidence in your God that someone who has the authority to actually kill you and torture you could be yelling in your face and you would just be like, I don't fear you. you, you there's nothing you could do that's going to cause me to live in fear and anxiety. Could you imagine living like that? So because there are 366 commands, I figured it would be a wonderful meditation for us just to read every single one of them tonight. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Some of you are like, oh no, I came on the wrong night. Don't fear, it's okay. We'll be out by 10 o'clock. Let me just give you a couple of these though. And I know you know this, but again, there's something powerful about just hearing the reality and the truth of God's word. And I'm not gonna give you a long list, but just listen to a few of these. Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Oh, that's true. That is not a refrigerator statement. That is truth that you can stand upon. That the Lord has delivered me from all my fears. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8 and 9, Paul writes, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. 
Yeah, you might be going through hardships and difficulties, but that is no reason to despair. That is no reason to worry. Romans 8, and this is a splattering, so sorry, tech guys, but verse 31 says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? And then in verse 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he begins to make a list. Shall tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And of course, the obvious answer is no. None of those things can separate you. So the most severe, intense things that you could go through as a human will never, ever separate you from the love of Christ. Oh. Wish you guys would get excited. I'm just kidding. Uh, verse 37 through 39, listen to this. Paul summarizes and says, No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors. Do you know what a conqueror is? It's like Alexander the Great, Napoleon. They were conquerors. They came in and just decimated lands. And Paul says that in Christ, what can touch you? You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. That you do not have to placate. You do not have to roll over and play dead. You do not have to fear because in Christ you are more than Alexander the Great. You have more power and ability and strength than Napoleon did. Well, I've got nothing. I'm, I'm weak. I know. But you've got Jesus, which means you are more than a conqueror. Do you know how phenomenal that is? And then he goes on and says, For I am sure meaning this is guaranteed, that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh. So what do you have to fear? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. There's no need of want. In fact, when you look at Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd in, in the Hebrew, it actually is the Lord is actively shepherding me, is a better way of translating it. That yes, he's the great shepherd, which is good, but he's actively doing the work of shepherding. And do you know what every single shepherd gives his sheep? Three things, protection, provision, and direction. Even bad shepherds give those three things to their sheep. And you do not have a bad shepherd, you have a good shepherd. And if you have a good shepherd, do you realize that you don't even have to ask, he's going to give you protection, provision, and direction. And strangely, isn't it, isn't it interesting that those are the three things that we typically pray the most about? Oh God, I need protection. Oh God, I need provision. God, I need direction. And yet he's a good shepherd. He will give you those things. So can I rest in his provision? That even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there's no reason to fear. Why? Because he's with me. In fact, he will set up a table, a banquet in the presence of my enemies. Which means what? You are rejoicing and celebrating in the midst of your enemies. And we're talking Jewish culture. Which means with every party, there's always dancing. Which means they weren't Nazarenes. But in that culture, if there, was, if there was a party, guaranteed, there was dancing. So there is a celebration, there is a dance, there is an exuberance in the very middle of your enemies. How can you do that if you're walking in fear? You can't. Because you can't rejoice. You're shut down. So do you realize the whole key to this is you've got to know that your God is near. And when you realize that your God is near, which is actually in our passage, look back at verse 5. Paul says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is near. So be anxious for nothing. So how can I be anxious for nothing? How can I have no worry or no fear? Oh, God's with me. And what is going to separate me from his love? What is going to separate me from his presence? Can anything this side of eternity separate me from him? Paul says, what are you talking about? Nothing can separate us from him. That's phenomenal. That's so good. Uh, Zephaniah 3.17, listen to this. 
The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Oh. Or 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and self-control. There is no reason for us to walk in fear. There's none. Now, that is a lot easier said than done. I mean, if you read Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells this great story about, hey, do not worry. Hey, don't worry about what you eat. Don't worry about what you wear. Because, you know, hey, he takes care of the lilies of the field. He takes care of the birds. And aren't you more important and significant than even them? And we're like, yes, we are. Amen. Praise the Lord. But then we worry about our food and our clothing. And I mean, it's really easy to say, yes, there's no reason to fear. Until you're in one of those moments where you actually get to prove it. And again, I don't know about you, but over the last couple of years, I think the church as a whole has proven that we may talk a great talk, but I don't know if we actually believe this stuff. Because if we actually believed it, we wouldn't fear. We actually would not be pushed around by our political system. We are to respect, and to as much as we are able, according to our conscience, we are to submit. I, I fully agree with that. I will pay my taxes. Praise the Lord. That's fresh in my mind. So. <laughs> but folks, there's no, there's no reason to fear the government. Well, we might go to jail. Christians have always gone to jail. Well, it might go on my record. Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, what happens if they kill me? You are promised a martyr's crown. Yeah, so, all right, so what? Now, that's easy for me to say right now. But if the guy's busting the back of the doors, you know how hard it's going to be for us to be like, mm-hmm. Somehow this has to move beyond just mere theor theory and concept. This has to move into life stuff. So how on earth are we going to practically not fear? Okay, I understand. We have, we have a command every single day of the year, do not fear. How on earth are we going to do that? I want to give you two ideas. And both of them come from our passage. The first one comes back in that verse 5 idea that the Lord is near. When I realize that the Lord is near, that he actually indwells my life, there's actually no reason to fear. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn it over a few pages to Hebrews chapter 13. <clears throat> I, I want you to see this. This, is, this has so radically changed my life. Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, the writer of Hebrews is coming to an end, and he's, he's bringing this, his whole argument to a conclusion. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not going to go through the, the full context here, but he gets into the verse 5, and at the end of verse 5, he makes this really profound statement. So this is Hebrews chapter 13, the end of verse 5. And, and this is what the writer says. For he himself has said... So God is, speak, God is saying this. He himself has said this. So this isn't a, uh, we love God to have said this. This isn't, oh, I heard a rumor once. God may have whispered this. The writer of Hebrews says, God himself has declared this from his mouth. And what has God said? God has said, I will never leave you, never will I forsake you. And verse 6 says, so then we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Did you hear that? God himself is speaking. In fact, it is so clear in the passage because there is a double emphasis. It says, he himself has said. So you cannot get around the fact that God himself is speaking. Well, what, what, is, what is God saying? Look at this. For God himself has looked at you in the eyes, staring you down, and he says, 
I will never leave or forsake you. And the conclusion is, if God has actually said that to us, which he has, if God has actually said, I will never leave or forsake you, then we can confidently say with boldness, with assurity, standing upon a bedrock of promise, we can say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid for what can man do to me. If God is with me, what can, what can you do to me? If God is on my side, what can the world do? Now here's the profundity of the passage. This is so phenomenal to me. When you look at this idea of I will never leave you or forsake you, I wanted to know what's the difference between those two words. Because why, why is it important that he says I will never leave and forsake? So when I looked at the word leave, it means to leave, to abandon, or to desert. When I look up the word forsake, it means to leave, to abandon, to desert, to forsake. And I went, I don't understand. Because it's like the same definition, but two different words. And here's what I discovered. The first word, I will never leave you, that word leave is this idea of, it can, it can refer to anything. For example, have you ever gotten on a, like a, say you're gonna take a car trip or a little vacation, and you get in your vehicle and you start driving, and about an hour down the road, the kid goes, oh no! I forgot my pillow. And of course, you go, it doesn't matter. And they're like, no, no, it's my special pillow. And you're like, we are not going back. We are already an hour into this. We're not driving an hour back to drive back this hour. We will buy you a new pillow. There is a Walmart somewhere. I will spend $5. That's this idea. I will never do that. I will never leave you like an object. Uh, several years ago, uh, I was speaking in Tennessee and I had a good friend from Australia who was in town and he says, hey, can I, can I come to this conference with you? I was like, oh, I'd love to have you come with me to this conference. He says, do you have a water bottle I could borrow? And I said, no, because I'm very particular about my water bottles. I love my water bottles. In fact, I go nowhere without my water bottle. In fact, my, I have one right here. I am very protective about my water bottles and I do not know why. But ever since elementary school, I always have water with me and I, I, I like my water bottles. I'm very finicky about my water bottles. He says, can I just borrow one? I said, oh, oh. okay, you're my friend and you're from Australia. I will, sure, I will let you borrow a water bottle, but I'm very protective about my water bottles. Please protect my water bottle. Halfway through the week, he comes up and says, Nathan, I, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. We were in the middle of Nashville. We were doing some, some ministry stuff. I put the water bottle down. We got really busy and I forgot we had to hurry and leave. I got in the van, I left, and I don't, I have no idea where it's at. And I have abandoned, left your water bottle. And I says, you are no longer my friend. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. We're still friends, sort of. And do you know what he did in my water bottle? He left it. That word ticked me off. Now, in all openness and fairness, uh, later that week I was in a meeting, took my water bottle, went to the coffee shop, set it down, had a coffee meeting, left, and I abandoned, <laughs> left, <laughs> forsook my water bottle. And in one week, I lost two water bottles. I have left, abandoned, deserted, that's this word. And God says, I am never going to do that to you. I'm never going to treat you like some random object and just be like, you know what? No big deal. I can replace that later. God says, I will never do that to you. See, I'm not just going to be going down in my, in, in, the, in, in my purpose and my plan and be like, oh, you know what? I just, oh, forgot you. Eh, I'll replace you. God says, I'm not going to do that to you. Now, that's the first word. The second word, forsake, which is translated leave, forsake, desert, abandon. It's the same concept, but every time that word shows up, it's always in relationship. And God says, I will not do that in relationship. Uh, when I was a little kid, uh, my mom would take us shopping. I hated going shopping with my mom. 
And it's probably because, you know, she took hours and hours and hours to shop. And as a little kid, you don't want to spend hours and hours and hours at the store. And so I had to be inventive and creative. And so uh, we would go to like the, you know, like the Walmarts or the Kmarts back in the day. And they would have those clothes rack in the circle. You know, as a little kid, they, they are so, they're like a little fort. And so, you know, you get in the middle of the, of, the, of the clothes and you're just hanging out and you're playing your games. And I loved when someone else would come and start to shop. Because, you know, they didn't know I was on the inside, and so they're looking through the clothing, and they would, you know, open it up so they could look at the clothing, and that was my perfect opportunity to spring out and be like, hey! And, of course, they would scream, and I would laugh, and it was, it was lovely. This one day, I come out from the, my fort and my clothes party, and uh, I look around, and do you know what my mother did? My mother abandoned me. Yeah, she left me. And I was searching all over the place. I'm like, Mom! Mom! Now, unbeknownst to me, she was hiding behind the corner. I, I know. <laughs> Trying to see if I actually cared. And so when this happened last week, let me tell you, it just, <laughs> this just caused such fear. And, and Just kidding. It wasn't last week. It was, it was a month ago. But... But that's this idea. Uh, you guys know Jeremiah Bullock. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a back story of a Jeremiah Bullock story. Uh, we were in Tennessee at one of our conferences, and you know Jeremiah's oldest son, CJ. Uh, this, is, this would have been some years ago, so CJ was probably, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. And uh, we were wrapping up the conference, and, and Jeremiah had left, and Corinda had left. And I'm turning things off, and I look, and here's CJ. And I go, what are you doing? He goes like, I think my dad left me. I go, I go, what? I go, Jeremiah would never do that. Now, if, you know, if you've met Jeremiah, he would. So, you know, unintentionally, right? But he goes, like, I, think, I think he thought my mom was taking me, and I think my mom thought my dad was taking me, and here I am. So I called Jeremiah. I'm like, are you missing anything? He goes, no, I'm good. I says, well, I, I have some of your DNA here, and he says, you're missing something. And I says, you have abandoned your son. And of course, being Jeremiah, he says, I'll leave him. I don't care. So <laughs> he did come back and pick him up eventually. But that's this word. It's this idea of in relationship, you're being left. Think about what God is saying. God says, I'm never going to treat you as some mere object that I can just quickly replace. Nor in relationship... Am I just going to go, oh, well, no worries. God says, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to treat you as an object. I'm never going to, in the midst of our relationship together, I will not forsake you. Isn't that encouraging? But that's actually not the best part of the whole passage. The best part of the passage is actually what is not translated. There is a couple of words in the Greek that we don't know what to do with. It's hard to translate it. And the reason we don't know what to do with it is because there's a whole bunch of negative terms like no, 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 in the passage. And in English, anytime you put two negatives together, it makes it a positive. Remember those horrible moments from sixth grade grammar? <laughs> you know, right? Like, no, I'm not doing that, which means I, I am doing it, right? I mean, it's just, it's that weird English thing. But in Greek, if you put multiple negatives together, it emphasizes the negative. Not, 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 kind of an idea. Are you tracking? So listen to this. In the passage, <clears throat> it says, I will never desert you. But there's also another never right before the never. So it actually says, I will never, never leave you. I will never, never desert you. I'm never, never going to treat you as some object and just throw you on the wayside. I will never, never do that. And then it says, nor, that's another one, never, never forsake you. Five times in the passage, it says, I will never, never leave you, nor never, never forsake you. And I mentioned this the other day, but anytime you have a repetition, it's there for emphasis. It's there to strengthen it. 
So think about this. God himself is looking you square in the eyes and he says, I have something to tell you. I will never, 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 never leave or forsake you. Never going to do it. It's impossible. I can't do it. When David was told uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, he comes to God and says, God, I'm surrounded by the Philistines. Will you deliver them into my hand? And God says, I will doubtlessly deliver them into your hand. And the word is so strong in the Hebrew. It's this idea that there is such a guarantee. There is such a promise. If God gave you that kind of a promise, how would you go into battle? Wouldn't what, what you just, I have thought this through so many times. I've said, if I was David, I would have looked at my troops and said, sit this one out. Because God promised me. So let's see what he does. And my best friend, Jonathan, he already proved that God can win with many or with few. So if God has guaranteed the victory, let's, let's see what happens if I just go into the battle by myself with no sword. Let's just see what happens. I mean, that's what I would have done. Because there is a guarantee, absolute, take it to the bank, absolute confidence that God has promised and he cannot lie. Could you imagine having that kind of confidence in your own soul? To realize that God has looked you in the eye and with absolute clarity and promise, and he can't lie. God cannot lie. God can do whatever he wants. No, he can't. God cannot defy, de, de, deny, that's what I was looking for, deny his nature. He can't lie. He's truth. It's not that he chooses not to lie. He cannot lie. In fact, he says this several times in scriptures. I cannot lie. I cannot change. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I cannot lie. And if God, who cannot lie, has made you a promise... I will never, ever, 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 ever leave or forsake you. Don't you think he means it? Can't you take that to the bank? I was preaching this in a conference, and uh, there was a Greek scholar sitting on the front row right to my left, which intimidated me, because I'm talking about this passage about five times in the passage, never, ever, 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 ever. And then I got self-conscious, and I went, is that true? Because <laughs> you know, I'm like... That better be in the passage, because I saw it. Charles Spurgeon wrote about the fact that there's five negatives. And if Charles Spurgeon said it, surely it must be true. And he looked at the passage in the Greek, he says, no, you're wrong. There is not five negatives. And of course, I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> he says, the grammar itself suggests two more. So you have five actual words, and then the grammar gives you two more. That is seven negatives. And if you understand how the Bible works, that is a number of completion. In other words, this is a perfect promise that says, God's looking you in the eyes, saying, I will never, ever, 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 ever leave or forsake you. So no wonder the writer of Hebrews says, well, then we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Because what can man do to me? If God has looked me in the eyes and said, I will never, ever, 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 ever do it. I will never leave you or forsake you. Could you imagine walking into your job with that kind of confidence? Not arrogance, but a confidence in your God. Could, could you imagine looking at your next bill statement or your bank account with that kind of confidence going, God, I have no idea how you're going to fix this, <laughs> but I'm going under. God, I don't know what you're going to do with this economy. I don't know what you're going to do with the presidency. God, I don't know what you're going to do with, with the country of America as a whole. But Lord, I trust you. And whether things get better or things get worse, God, the one thing I do know for sure is that you will never, ever, 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 ever leave or forsake me. So I can rest. Why would you fear if you knew that? Really quick, let me give you the other one. Not only is it the idea that the Lord is near, uh, look back at, at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. We're going to look at this a little bit more tomorrow night. But Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So if you want to walk without fear, if you don't want to walk or have anxiety in your life, you must realize that the Lord is near. He will never, ever leave or forsake you. And everything must be given to God in prayer. 
And again, we'll flesh this out some more tomorrow. But let me give you this passage. It's just so good. Uh, you know 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Peter says, cast all your cares, all your anxieties upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Do you realize you can actually give God everything? Why? He cares. He loves you. And because he cares and because he loves you, he is willing to take all of your anxiety and worry and fear and foreboding. But let me give you another passage. In fact, Peter is referencing back to Psalm 37, verse 5. Listen to Psalm 37, 5. The psalmist says, Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. Or commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. That word commit actually means to roll a burden upon a beast of burden. Uh, imagine I come up to you and I say, you have a thousand pounds that you have to carry across 500 miles of desert. Can you do it? No. I mean, not even Pastor Dennis, who's just, oh, can't. I mean, no offense, but... And Wesley's getting close. Oh, but even Wesley can't do it. Sorry. How on earth are you going to carry a thousand pounds across 500 miles of desert? Well, that's impossible! Unless you have a beast of burden, like a camel or a donkey. They are made to carry heavy loads. So the word commit here in the Hebrew actually means to take a burden, to take this weight, and roll it upon a beast of burden, like a camel. And isn't it fascinating that you could roll a thousand pounds on the back of a camel, and then you could take the camel and walk across 500 miles of desert. And you are carrying the burden across 500 miles of desert, but the weight is not upon you. And God says, oh, I will be that beast of burden in your soul. I will carry that weight for you. Cast your anxieties upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do it. Take the weight. Take the fear. Take the pressures of your life. Take all the burdens of your soul and roll them on the, upon the back of your God. Trust in him, and he will do it. You don't have to carry it. And again, tomorrow we'll flesh out this whole idea of what does it mean to take everything to God in prayer and not walk in anxiety. Because there's a profound idea in that. But can I encourage you? I don't know what you're facing this evening. I don't know what you came in with. I don't know what fears and anxieties and pressures and worries may be swirling on in your heart and your mind. But do you realize that there is no reason for you to carry it anymore? You can actually cast that upon the Lord. He will carry it for you. He is a beast of burden that just delights in carrying your loads. And he has looked at you in the eyes and he says, look, I promise you, I promise you, and I cannot lie, I promise you, I will never, ever, 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 ever leave or forsake you. So there's no reason to fear. Will you trust me? And that is a good question. Will we trust him? He has promised Lord, perhaps nobody else needs to hear this, but oh, I need it. Lord, I need to know that you are always with me. And it's not that you just go before me or just behind me or around me. You actually live inside of me through your Holy Spirit. And God, you have promised, you yourself have declared that you will never treat us like some random object that you can replace, nor are you in relationship with us ever going to just forsake us and leave us behind. In fact, so strongly have you said that it is a never, 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 never statement. And Lord, it's so mind-boggling to me that you just say, oh, give me your burdens, give me your worries, give me your fears. Just roll them upon my back. You do not have to carry them anymore. And he does not qualify what kind of burdens, what kind of fears, because they all can be carried upon his shoulders.
family, finances, work, future, politics, economy, doesn't matter. Everything can rest upon his shoulders because he cares for you. Do you need this? Do you need him to carry your load? Have you been weighted down? Are you just, do you just feel like you're drowning and just bobbing up for air once in a while? Do you realize that you can cast your burdens upon the Lord? He cares for you. He will never leave or forsake you. And I'd love just to pray for you.